Well, good morning. It's time to start this morning. We'll let everybody get to their seats. If you would be opening your Bibles to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11 is where we're going to begin today. Luke chapter 11, verse 27. Luke eleven twenty seven. David, would you lead us in prayer to start us today, please? Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the blessing of this day. We're thankful for the blessing of your love and your caring, Father. We're thankful for your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Father, we pray today that you be with us as we study more of your word. Father, that we may be able to live out your will. Father, we pray for those that can't be with us this morning, those that are sick. We ask that you be with them and be with their families, comfort them and guide them. Father, we ask that as we learn more of your word, that we can fly through our lives, keep it in our heart and our minds, that we may grow in a Christian way. Father, we ask that you forgive us of our wrongs. We ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Last week, we concluded our thoughts on Jesus' discussion of evil spirits and casting out evil spirits and how they are able or were able in those days to enter back into an individual if that person did not fill that void with spiritual things. Well, now we come to a passage. Jesus is in the process of discussing these matters. And a woman that is in the crowd, hearing these things, suddenly cries out to him. Notice beginning in verse 27. And it came about while he said these things that one of the women in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. And he said, on the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. First off, Jesus is not putting down his mother whatsoever. The things that he is saying here is not at all to indicate that Mary was not a good person, that she was not a good mother. But what he is acknowledging here is like he has done on two previous occasions in Matthew 12 and verse 50, and also in Mark 3 and verse 35, is to try to help the Jews understand that physical kinship was not as important as spiritual kinship. Now we understand from our study of the Jews that their lineage meant everything to them. Their genealogies, that's why we see the genealogies of Jesus set forth in the book of Matthew and also in the book of Luke because they were so significant to the Jews. Well here we have this woman who is seeing what is taking place and she's not necessarily, at least nothing in the text would indicate that she is placing any kind of special... Uh, spiritual significance upon Mary. She's just recognizing that Mary was a blessed person because of who her son was. Now I know that there have been times that my children have done something good and I've had people tell me, well I'm sure you're proud. And we are proud of our children, aren't we? Or we've had people say, I've had people say to me and and different things, well, your your parents are probably proud. And, And we understand that from the physical relationship standpoint. We are proud of our children's accomplishments. But what this lady is saying, she says that the woman that bore you, your mother, said she is blessed, she she must be proud of the things that you're accomplishing. Well, Jesus noticed that he says there in verse 28, he says, on the contrary, he said, those who are blessed. Now in this case, when he uses the term blessed, he's talking about from a spiritual standpoint. 
Those who are blessed are those who hear the Word of God and observe it. Now this is a great passage that we can turn to when we are speaking with those who propose the veneration of Mary. Just because she was the physical mother of Jesus, that did not make her of any greater significance than anyone else. Just because she was the one that was chosen to give birth to the Messiah did not mean that any special spiritual significance should be connected to her. It does not say that we should worship her, that we, to use that big word, to venerate her or to view her as a a, a significantly holy person. Nothing in the text tells us that whatsoever. But also... We can also see from this text that just being related to a faithful person does not give you a one-up on anyone else. Now, on one hand, we can look at this from the standpoint of saying, well, if we had Christian parents that brought us up in the Lord, that raised us in the church, then that is certainly a blessing. I think we would all agree with that. But just because mom and dad are faithful Christians... Does that give us any type of spiritual significance at all? No. Because faith is an individual thing. How many times, and I'm sure that there are people here today that are this way and it's a devastating thing, but how many times do we see those who are faithful Christians who have children grow up to not be faithful Christians? We see that quite often. And just because the parents are faithful, it does not mean that the children are going to automatically be faithful. I had someone tell me a couple of weeks ago that they had been through a lot of things in life and they had had really struggled, they hadn't served God, but that they thought that the faith of their grandmother is what had sustained them to the point in life that they were now able to become a child of God. So many times we have a misconception about the faith of others and the the connection that we have with others. And yes, that influence should be there. Yes, we should influence our children. We should influence all of those that we come into contact with. But just because I'm a faithful child of God, that does not guarantee that my children are going to grow up to be faithful. there's a much greater chance. That's right. There's a much greater chance. And like I said, I'm not downplaying the the fact that we can influence others. But it's the fact that my faith only has a direct bearing upon myself. I cannot, as, as the Mormons believe, I cannot be faithful for Wayne. They believe that if Wayne Smith passes away in an unfaithful state, that I can... As a result of my faith, I can be baptized on his behalf and my faith will save him. That's not what the scriptures teach. Our faith is an individual thing. We are to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. It's not based upon anything else. And so as I said, in this passage, Jesus is not... Uh, degrading his mother in any way. He's not saying that she was not a, a good person, a faithful person. It's not saying anything about that whatsoever. But what it's saying is from a spiritual standpoint, the relationship that we have with our brothers and sisters in Christ should be seen as the most precious, the most blessed of those relationships that we have in this life. Any questions or comments on these two verses? Y'all feel free to speak up. Feel free. Alright, if not, turn over to Matthew 23. We're going to begin in verse 13. Matthew chapter 23, verse 13. We're going to be looking at what is commonly referred to as the seven woes. And these were seven warnings that were given to the Jews by Jesus. Seven things that they were doing wrong. Corrections that needed to be made. 
Before we get into our discussion, I want us to read this whole section so that we have a better understanding of what we're going to be looking at. And it's quite a lengthy reading. We're going to read verses 13 through 36. So if you have your Bible, follow along with me. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from men. For you do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, because you devour widows' houses, even while for a pretense you make long prayers, therefore you shall receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel about on the sea and the land to make one a proselyte. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, whoever swears by the temple... That is nothing. But whoever swears by the, go- by the gold of the temple, he is obligated. You fools and blind men, which is more important, the gold or the temple that sanctified the gold. And whoever swears by the altar, that is nothing. But whoever swears by the offering upon it, he is obligated. You blind men, which is more important, the offering or the altar that sanctifies the offering? Therefore, he who swears both by the altar and by everything on it. And he who swears by the temple swears both by the temple and by him who dwells within it. And he who swears by heaven swears both by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites! For you tithe, mint, and dill, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice, and mercy, and faithfulness. But these are the things that you should have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides who strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and of the dish, so that the outside of it may become clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, For you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous, and say, If we had been living in the days of our fathers we would not have been partners with them in the shedding of the blood of the prophets. Consequently, you bear witness against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of the guilt of your fathers. You serpents, you brood of vipers, how shall you escape the sentence of hell? Therefore, behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. And some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, that upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of the righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things shall come upon this generation. Think about the things that Jesus has just said in that passage. Jesus is speaking to a group of people who were supposed to be holy. Who were supposed to be doing the Lord's will. But in each one of these passages, He starts out by saying, Scribes, Pharisees. Indicating who He's talking about. He's talking about those lawyers, those who were supposed to be experts in the law of Moses. He's talking to the Pharisees, those that were seen as the religious elite of the day. But he sums up both of those with the next term, hypocrites. The people are looking to you as spiritual guides. They're looking to you to be their leaders. They're going to the scribes. Remember, we talked back when we were discussing the parable uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the Good Samaritan. Sorry, I went blank there for a minute. In discussing the parable of the Good Samaritan, when it talks about the lawyer has come to Jesus. Well, this lawyer was one that everybody was looking to. Part of his job was to instruct and interpret the law of Moses. 
But yet, because of the way that they were performing their duties, they were not doing so in the way that God would have them to do so, and so they were seen as hypocrites. They were not faithful to God. We see in this long passage that we just looked at a variety of different sins. A variety of things that they were guilty of. Hypocrisy was just one. But there were many things that these people were guilty of. Now when we look at this passage in some translations, we see it in the King James, New King James, New American Standard, we see a listing here of eight woes in chapter 23. But in some other manuscripts, we see verse 14 left out. Now the reason that is, is because in some of the oldest manuscripts that have been found, verse 14 is not in those older manuscripts. But we see in other writings and in other places in the gospel accounts where Jesus addresses this very point. And so whether verse 14 was in the original or whether it was something that was added by uh, an inspired Christian later on, we don't know for certain. But we know that the point that is being made here is one that is true. And so it is one that we can look at, that we can view as being inspired of God. Because notice what it's talking about in that verse. It's talking about taking advantage of widows. Taking advantage of those that did not have anyone there to support them and take care of them. And so they were taking advantage of these ladies in some way. But notice that he also addresses this concept of making lengthy prayers. And they were not doing this from the heart. There's nothing wrong with praying a lengthy prayer if everything you're saying is truly from the heart and you're communicating that to God in a faithful fashion. But what they were doing is they were going out and they were offering these long prayers with repetitions and, and, and all of the, the rites and things that went along with the things that they were saying. But they were doing this not to truly communicate with God, but they were doing this so that people would look at them and think that they were more holy than they really were. To think that they were more faithful so he says on one hand, he says you're over here, you're taking advantage of those that, that can't take care of themselves. Remember, back in those times, widows did not have the same types of, of abilities and freedoms and privileges that they have in our day and time. In that day and time, if you did not have a man there to speak for you, whether it was a husband, whether it was your father, whether it was a son, it really put that lady in a precarious situation. And so oftentimes it would fall upon the religious leaders to watch out for them. Well, in some way, these religious leaders were taking advantage of them. Notice it says that they were devouring widows' houses. Some have speculated that what they were doing was that they were going in and they were trying to get these widows to turn over all of their property to them. And say, if you'll turn over all of this to us, we'll make sure you're taken care of. And so in that sense, they were gaining an advantage for themselves because they were gaining all of the personal possessions, all of the property of that widow. And that widow was, so to speak, becoming a ward of the temple. And if these individuals, if these religious leaders did not provide for her needs... That woe unto you, man. Do what? That woe unto you means take heed. That's right. These are warnings. These are warnings. Woe unto you. Pay attention to these things because these are things that were going on. Notice that from this. Notice Jesus is not saying these are things that could happen. He said these are things that are happening. Woe to you. Open your eyes. See the things that are taking place. But notice what he calls them at the very end of this. And we're going to go back and we're going to talk about each one of these woes. We may not get to all of it today. But notice he calls them blind guides. We see this in verse 16. They thought that they were the guides of the people, but really 
they were blind. They couldn't even see where they were going themselves. So how were they going to be able to guide anyone else? But then as we get to verse 33, notice he calls them serpents. He calls them a brood of vipers. Well, generally in the Bible, whenever we see an illustration of a serpent, what is that generally referring to? Something that's evil. Usually has some connotation with Satan. So he calls these people... Do I... Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But he's saying that these people who were supposed to be doing God's will, he says that they were actually serving the devil. They were serving the serpent. They were a brood of vipers, a group of snakes that were there that were producing harm rather than help. Okay, let's look at the first of these seven woes. We see that Jesus is condemning the scribes and the Pharisees for keeping people out of the kingdom of heaven. Notice in verse 13. He says, Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. Paraphrasing there. He says, You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. They were denying the fact that Jesus was the Savior. They were denying the fact that He was the one that was the door to the kingdom. And so, in doing that, they were convincing people not to trust in Jesus. They were keeping people out of the kingdom by the influence that they had. And certainly we can understand uh, on the part of the people, these were the ones that they had always looked up to as their spiritual guides. These were the ones that they had always seen as the ones that could be trusted and now these were the very individuals who were saying, do not trust Jesus. He's not who He says He is. And so on one hand, we can kind of understand why some of the people did not trust Jesus because those who were supposed to be their leaders, they were the ones that were convincing them not to trust in Jesus. But Jesus says you need to watch out because He says not only are you not entering the kingdom. He says, but you're keeping other people out of the kingdom as well. Thereby, they were essentially blocking the door of heaven. Through the influence that they had, they were not letting people come to Jesus. And so they needed to change. Jesus needed their eyes to be open to the fact that through their hypocrisy in this regard, that it was not just influencing them, but it was influencing all of these others as well. The second of these seven woes, Jesus condemns the leaders for teaching their converts this same hypocrisy that they were practicing themselves. Here were individuals who were leading their converts into a religion of works. Remember the law of Moses was based upon the letter of the law. It was based upon ritual. It was based upon tradition. Everything was based upon the operation of those things that were set forth in the law. But they were not being led to true righteousness. As we would say today, they were going through the motions, but their heart was not in it. They weren't being led to the truth. Therefore, as Jesus says in Matthew 13 and 15, it was making them twice as much a child of hell. And we see the reason that was, was because on one hand, they thought that what they were doing was right. They thought that they were serving God. They thought God was pleased with what they were doing. But in effect, what they were doing was harming themselves, harming the faith of others, but then they were turning around and they were teaching that to other people as well. The they Pharisees, were teaching... The Pharisees didn't believe in Christ. No, they didn't. But the Sadducees did The Sadducees had a little bit different view. Um, they did not believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in uh, angels. They didn't believe any in any type of spirituality. 
Basically what the Sadducees believed was that this life is all there is. Uh, you do the best you can here and you're going to live a good life because when this life is over, that's all there is. And, you know, I've often heard people say that's why they were called sad you sees because it was a sad situation for them to be in. Um, of course, that's not the origin of the word. But the difference in the two, the Pharisees believed in an afterlife. They believed that when you died that you went to, uh, went to heaven or went to a, a better place. So Christ is the Yes. But whenever we look at what he's saying here, he says... You're still leading these people, but you're leading them away from righteousness, whereas you should be leading them to righteousness. And as such, you're a servant of the devil. Y'all feel free to speak up. I, I know you know how to talk, so. Yes, ma'am. Pretty much, pretty much. They, they viewed everything strictly on a, a, a physical plane. Everything was just, uh, just this life, that there was nothing, nothing else but this life. So does that mean they didn't believe the prophets? Either? No. I mean, any, anything that questioned what they had been led to believe, they, they, dis, they discarded they didn't, they didn't listen to the prophets. They didn't pay heed to those things because in their belief system, this life was all there is. So they were Jewish by birth, but pretty much... They were Jewish by birth and they went through all of the rituals and things of that nature, but they did not believe that that went on after this life. That basically by living according to the law of Moses that that was the best life you could live. It would basically be like someone in this life who did not believe in God living according to the morality that's set forth in the Bible. They, they follow the moral teachings but they don't follow the spiritual teachings. And so you really saw a marked difference there in the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees they focused on the spiritual aspects as well as the physical aspects where the Sadducees focused upon the, on the physical but disregarded the spiritual. And, and I know it, it's, hard to, it's hard to understand, hard to, to comprehend, especially with uh, the devotion that the Jews had to so many things, but we can kind of equate that to the differences that we see in Christianity today. I mean, there is such a broad spectrum of differing ideas among um, the different so-called churches that we see that it comes back down to this concept that essentially the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were Jewish denominations, if you want to put it that way. They, um, and, and you had others, other smaller groups. You had the Essenes, you had the Zealots, you had, you had several other uh, fragments of the Jews that had separated based upon uh, various beliefs. What it all amounts to, really, it's just like it is in this day and time. They want to make up their own rules and live by them. Right. That's right. So they, they believed in God, uh, the Sadducees did, and, and what I'm understanding is that they uh, just believe that God uh, living, doing His will would give them blessings in this life. Right, right. They, they believe that it was all focused upon this life. It's kind of like what, a, what Unitarians believe today. Uh, they believe that, that you receive blessings by serving God in this life, but that, that's all there is. Right. That, that when you pass from this life that you just simply cease to exist. And that the blessings that you receive are in this life, not in the life to come. So what was their belief on Messiah? They weren't listening to the prophets, so they didn't believe that was happening? No, because they didn't believe that a Messiah was going to come. They didn't believe that he was going to rise from the dead. They didn't, because it was all this life. They had been led to believe that this life was what mattered. 
And we have to remember, by the time that the first century came around, the Jewish religion had become so far removed from the original teachings of the law of Moses uh, that, 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 as we see, even among the Pharisees and the scribes, those who were supposed to know the most about the law of Moses, they had, they had so strayed from what it actually taught that they were, they were teaching and believing all kinds of things. And that's why, as I said, we see even today those who claim to be Christians, there are some that go so far as to even deny the deity of Jesus. Some that go so far as to say that Jesus was just a good man, that he was just another prophet. Uh, we see some that go so far as to... Uh, there, there are even some religious groups today that we could call them atheistic because their belief systems are so far away from what we believe that God is, what we know that God is through our study of the Scriptures I mean, it's amazing the things that people can rationalize in, in themselves and, and try to support with their belief systems. I mean, it, it's truly amazing the things that we see people getting into and that, that they believe. And you know, it's something that you've heard me say this many times. So much of what we read in the Bible, we have to approach with common sense. We have to approach from a logical perspective. But whenever we try to read things into it that's not there, or whenever we try to make it apply to situations that it was never intended to apply to, or we try to say one thing is literal when it's meant to be figurative, you know, we've seen that in looking at the book of Revelation on Wednesday nights. It's so easy for people to turn away from the truth when they're not using common sense with the Scriptures. And you know, something that, that I've always believed, and if you disagree with me on this, that's fine. I'd love, to, I'd love to hear your point on this. But my belief has always been that the things that we find in the New Testament that truly pertain to our soul's salvation are easy to understand. They are things that are set forth in the plainest terms. But then there are other things there that can be left up to different interpretations. We're going to talk about one of those in our, uh, our sermon here in just a little while and talking about the Holy Spirit. You know, there's a couple of different, uh, couple of different uh, prevailing beliefs in the church today about the Holy Spirit. Now, which one of those is true? It's up to personal interpretation. But it does not change the work of the Spirit. It does not change what that means for us. But the things that truly have a bearing upon our soul salvation, those are the things that are easily set forth in the Scriptures. Any questions or comments before we stop for this morning? Yes, sir. Let the Scriptures interpret themselves. You may not have to do that. That's right. That's right. And that's why I said we have to approach it with common sense, we read the scriptures, we examine what it says, and we go off of what it says.